Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the standing room only uh, event at Citrus on the uh, new uh, revolution in manufacturing of how 3D printing fits into emerging patterns in the world industry and in society at large. I want to say two quick introductory things. Uh, the first is stealing a line from Paul Markley, who will be speaking later, that it's clear that this is a third industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution having begun in Europe in, between the period 1780 to 1820. Uh, the second one being in the United States when Henry Ford revolutionized the manufacturing of cars with the moving production line. And now with digital manufacturing, uh, connecting computer-aided design to manufacturing, uh, we're in our third exciting revolution of manufacturing. The second thing I want to say, uh, which leads into Professor Hartman's talk, is that we made a big effort in Citrus to stress the important role of uh, interactive design and co uh, computer-aided manufacturing and rapid prototyping in education. Uh, we've invested a lot of Citrus money in some spectacular labs on the first floor of this building that we call the Invention Lab. Uh, Bjorn and Eric Paulos are the director, the co-director of that lab. And in the face of the fact that the whole world is facing the uh, implications of MOOCs, you know, where massive online courses are uh, challenging the role of uh, undergraduate education for big courses, we feel in Citrus that this area of uh, rapid prototyping, 3D printing, and invention is the thing that's going to keep the leading universities of the world, like Berkeley, way ahead of the game, uh, creating opportunities for students to learn how to uh, invent new things, uh, to enjoy that invention process, and as much as anything, also with the Citrus Foundry uh, to lead those inventions uh, to uh, new company opportunities. And so without further ado, uh, Bjorn is one of our young, distinguished faculty, has joined the faculty about five years ago. He and Eric are our uh, new wave of faculty that are bringing this online invention and special ways of doing creativity to classroom teaching. And I'd like you to uh, warmly welcome him to the podium uh, as our first speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for that kind introduction. So uh, as Paul mentioned, I'm one of the co-directors of the Citrus Invention Lab. And as such, um, I'd like to start out by talking about the impact of 3D printing and digital fabrication more broadly um, on education, both at Berkeley and more broadly in society. So if you take the elevator out in the lobby down to the first floor and you walk down the hallway, pretty much underneath where we're uh, currently standing, you'll find the Citrus Invention Lab. This is a lab facility uh, that's been around for a little over a year now and uh, has three main themes to it. The first is access to new fabrication tools and breeding a culture of prototyping and making in our students. The second theme then is learning, so offering the right kind of courses that introduce students um, to, in an experiential way, to this new equipment and to the design process uh, as currently practiced. And finally, the third theme is launching. So looking at how to take projects beyond student ideas out into the world through uh, product incubation. Now, if you walk into the lab on any given day, you'll find that the workhorses of our lab are actually not the high-end fancy equipment. It's these low-budget 3D printers that are now about $1,500 or so. And we have a bank of three of them basically going around the clock, partially because it takes a while for any print to finish, uh, but partially because of also just such huge student demand. And these are the perfect kind of entry gateway experience because the software is fairly simple and it is uh, amazingly motivating for students to take their own model and pick up their own part. Um, they still have to clean it manually, hold it in their hand and say, I made this. Now, other tools you find in the lab is then also some industrial 3D printing equipment. And you go up about an order of magnitude or two in price, and mostly what you get for that is finer resolution, maybe the use of other materials. 
So as we move from early ideas to final prototypes, where fit and finish start to matter, these machines come into play. However, not everything is 3D printing, and I want to make sure to uh, point out that there's a larger story of uh, computer-controlled fabrication equipment that, that has different machines working together, and it's really the combination of a whole tool chain of these machines that make the most exciting student projects possible. So on our 3D printers, we mostly create um, enclosures, casings, for game controllers, for other electronics, uh, but also, for example, 3D sculpture. So on the top, you see a sculpture by Carlos Saken, who is in the audience. But then there are many other tools that are also important. So the laser cutter is a workhorse of all uh, fabrication labs because it has a lower barrier of entry. You only need to do 2D design rather than 3D design. And so um, you cut forms out of sheet material, that doesn't mean you're stuck in 2D because there's now better and better design software that allows you to assemble these sheets into 3D forms. And uh, this particular one is actually a lampshade that was uh, designed in a workshop that Ron Rael, who's also in the audience, and I ran in the School of Architecture this summer. Other machines that get a lot out of use in, in our lab include a circuit board mill. So this is a computer controlled milling machine that is just very high speed and high precision. So you can, in a matter of hour, uh, make your own circuit boards and then um, uh, stuff it with components. And then finally, 3D scanning as well. So what do students do with this new digital fabrication equipment? Um, I just wanted to show you a quick overview of a couple uh, course projects. That, that students come up with in the lab. So we teach different types of classes. Uh, Eric Paulus teaches a course called Critical Making that combines engineering students with students from all over campus, from the social sciences, from the humanities, from rhetoric, art practice. And these students then use our fabrication equipment, for example, to come up with new tactile games that you play um, eyes free while wearing um, a blindfold. Um, of course, there are skills involved in learning these tools. So, for example, one of the biggest gating skills is knowing how to 3D model, how to create a complex model. So we take students in kind of one-week exercises from having no skill to being at the level where they can create something that looks like a game controller and that can house electronics and where the pieces fit together. And final projects in my course tend to look something like this. This is a smart cup that uh, senses how much you drink over the course of the day, and what type of liquid you drink over the course of the day. Now, this may play to the quantified self crowd who just wants to know a lot of data about their daily lives, but it, there are also important medical uses. For example, for dialysis patients who have to keep um, detailed accounts of how much liquids they consume. And in 2013, these kind of smart products never stand alone. There's uh, usually some kind of software running that connects to these products as well. So in this case, there's an iPhone application that, that can tell you how much uh, caffeine you've had, whether you should stop drinking Coke, or whether you haven't had enough liquid by lunch. And so building these products in the course of 10 weeks requires all of this equipment in the lab. So here you can see the cup itself was 3D modeled and then 3D printed with an inner sleeve, an outer sleeve, a lid and a hollow base that fits electronics that were milled on a circuit board mill um, and then our um, the electronics attached to sensors and a wireless radio to communicate with your phone. And so the students very cleverly observed that you know, by experimentation, if you shine light at, with at different wavelengths into this liquid, uh, different amounts of energy arrive at the other end and so you can actually do a, a good job at um, classifying what you're drinking. Here's another project. So you see the same kind of pattern, a custom 3D printed enclosure that then houses electronics. This is a wireless drip irrigation controller that you can uh, control from your phone or tablet that has a moisture sensor, an internal 3D printed valve, and then you just kind of attach your drip irrigation line to the right and the left. Um, another 
great area of uh, 3D printing is the medical field because here you need customization for an audience of one. Right? So for example, one of the products we're undertaking right now with a biodesign lab at UCSF is custom molded retainers that have radios inside so they can smartly detect whether you're wearing them or not. Um, but they all, of course, have to be molded to the shape of, of your mouth, and so the mold itself uh, is going to be 3D printed. Something that really struck me, this came uh, as a student response to this type of studio class, is that it really resonates with students. That students believe that this kind of experiential learning enabled by modern digital fabrication equipment um, is essential and really should be offered to everyone on campus. And I think we've seen a shift here where maybe a decade or two ago, students came in with a lot of hands-on skills and then had to learn a lot of the conceptual material later. I think there's been a reversal where we now very, we prepare our students very well on the analytical side, but they are so busy with their academics that they never get the experiential side before they arrive on campus. And so um, one of the exciting developments here at Berkeley is that we just uh, received a sizable gift from Paul Jacobs, um, the CEO of Qualcomm, and uh, we're establishing Jacobs Hall, the um, new design and innovation institute that's going to be just across the street, where we're looking to scale this types of hands-on experiential education enabled by 3D printing and other types of digital fabrication for the entire student corpus um, in the College of Engineering and the campus more broadly. Now, this is not restricted to the college level alone. Here's a, a, an example of the Castileja High School in Palo Alto. And you will find fab labs that have 3D printers, laser cutters, and other equipment increasingly moving down to the high school and maybe even middle school level. So this will be a very interesting, um, interesting development to follow. Now, I quickly wanted to touch on a second topic as well, since at Citrus we're very interested in making sure we're, we don't just have inventions in isolation in academia, but we want to impact the lives of Californians and the nations uh, more broadly. So that requires taking your ideas and making them real. So we've seen a lot of what I would call grassroots uh, impact of digital fabrication on entrepreneurship really from the bottom up. And as so often, artists lead the way. So for a number of years now, if you walk into an independent jewelry store, you probably see a display like this that are a single artist using a laser cutter to laser cut jewelry out of, for example, hardwood. And this has now just started to um, grow bigger. So there are marketplaces like Etsy where you can find hundreds of, of these vendors. But just uh, last week, Neiman Marcus announced that it now carries some 3D printed jewelry that was uh, designed by, by a local artist. And so you're seeing these ideas that maybe first were in the lab, then they hit artists, are really now starting to gain traction in the mainstream. Now, of course, you may say, well, jewelry is more on the artistic side. What about high-tech products? And here what you're seeing right now is really a resurgence of local startup companies in the Silicon Valley that are focusing more on hardware. And the reason they can do that is that the process of designing hardware is becoming much faster because of the types of additive manufacturing techniques that are available now. So my main thesis here is that crea creating hardware is increasingly similar to developing software. Of course, all of our modeling tools now are software, right? So you end up with files, but that's not where um, the similarities end. The success of open source software was really predicated on having a set of tools that enabled collaboration and coordination by remote teams. We had multiple different contributors. So one of these sites you may have heard of is GitHub that's currently the most popular online portal for sharing code and collaborating on open source projects. Now we start to see the first sites that try to replicate this model of collaboration for the creation um, of, um, of shape, of form, using uh, 3D printing. So Thingiverse is one example, but it actually turns out 
that these innovations are now feeding back into software companies. So just recently, uh, GitHub announced that you can now not only store code, but you can also store 3D model files, and they'll give you smart comparison tools between those models. Now, another key ingredient in the success of the Silicon Valley startup world in software is having incubators. So access to small start capital, but also, importantly, expertise on how to take your idea and grow it into a company. And what we're now seeing is an increasing number of hardware incubators pop up that take your idea and connect you with um, expert industrial designers, but also experts in, for example, contract manufacturing in, in Shenzhen. And actually at the bottom, Hexcelerator is a product, is a um, incubator that is run jointly between the Bay Area and Shenzhen. So if you get accepted into the program, you spend some time here, and then you fly over to China and spend two months there touring factories. Uh, final point is funding, access to capital. So many of you will hear, have heard of Kickstarter, hugely successful platform, mostly aimed at um, artistic productions, music albums, art, card decks. And what we're now seeing is also crowdfunding platforms that are specifically aimed at new products that are prototyped on a 3D printer that you then want to take the next step to market. So Dragon Innovation um, out of Cambridge in, in Massachusetts is uh, one example. And actually one of their first big success stories was uh, Dash Robotics that got funded over the uh, target amount and Dash Robotics is working downstairs in the Invention Lab as part of the, the Citrus uh, startup foundry. Another example of the type of product that first gets 3D printed and then later on injection molded at scale is this smart uh, bicycle computer. And what's really interesting here is that if you actually look at the 3D printer market itself, a lot of the 3D printers that the small startup companies make are themselves assembled in fab labs using laser cutters and using 3D printed parts. And there are many of them. My very last point before I uh, turn it over is we're only at the start of this. So this is from Venture Capital Journal. This is an exhaustive list of the kinds of lean hardware companies that got funded recently. And there are some big ones at the top like Jawbone, uh, Nest, but then the list also ends down here. And so if you compare that with the volume of venture capital that goes into software, we're really only uh, at the beginning. If you want to know more about the Invention Lab, here's our URL. Thank you very much. Bjorn, great. Thank you. We're going to make a very switch, quick switch now to Paul Markley. Uh, as we're getting set up for that with uh, Kozarov, our bank, uh, Paul has been the game changer of much reading material. It was his article on the uh, in third industrial revolution. I stole his idea. Uh, that was the feature article in The Economist. It was the lead story in The Economist. I think you'll show a, 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 a flash of that, uh, of that cover story. And actually, that was one of the biggest needle shifters, you might say, of awareness of 3D printing around the world. And in, in some ways, he's the international spokesperson, along with Peter Marsh, who's the next speaker for this very important field. So please, again, welcome him with a warm <laughs> round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, great pleasure to be here. Um, now, I'm a journalist, not a technologist. I'm a writer. And I've been writing about manufacturing for the best part of 25 years. And much of that has been old school manufacturing, car making and aerospace and things like that. And you were always told about how the economics of manufacturing were being dictated by unit labor costs, economies of scale, and hence we saw a lot of offshoring. But recently, we've come to see this world change. Now, you've got to make a difference between the hype and the reality. And we can start with the hype. Now, some people would say this is the world we now have, the uh, Star Trek fans will recognize this as the replicator, which is a machine that um, could make anything on the starship. 
and one of the famous starship captains would go up to this machine and say, tea, Earl Grey, hot, and it would make him a, a cup of Earl Grey tea, but not just the tea, it would print him the cup as well. Now, this, this is basically, some people will say, is the machines that we now have. This is a 3D printer. And we don't need factories anymore. We don't need manufacturing. That's all gone. Uh, we'll just be at home and we'll order whatever we want from a software equivalent of Amazon. And they'll send us a piece of software. And we just go up to a machine like this and say, make this. And it makes whatever you want. Well, that clearly, we're not in that world. We're a long, long way from that. That's the hype. But then... On the other end of the spectrum, we have this. Um, Terry Gao is the president of Hong Hai, also known as Foxconn, who make many of Apple's products um, in China. Um, he was asked at a shareholders meeting about one of those pieces I wrote about 3D printing, and he says it's a gimmick. Uh, it's not suitable for mass production. It doesn't have any commercial value, and that he'll spell his name backwards if he's proved wrong. And that's kind of my mission now. <laughs> Now, the truth, of course, actually lies somewhere in the middle. Mr. Gao is partly right. But if you see 3D printing as a replacement for mass manufacturing, you're wrong. Because what's actually happening is it's enhancing traditional manufacturing, and it's also hybridizing with it. And um, the other point that you need to remember is that it's only just part of a much bigger revolution that's going on in manufacturing and that is basically that manufacturing is going digital. Now, Peter will go through many of these other things because um, he has looked at many of these areas in his book. Um, if I just run through them, I mean, firstly, you have the computer-aided design software, which underruns this, but it's not just the ability to design something on a computer screen. It's also the fact that you can simulate it in a computer screen. Now, many of the cars that we now drive, or we're beginning to drive, because this is fairly new in the mass manufacturing car business now, are in fact extensively test-driven in a computer, long before a wheel ever touches the ground. So, yes, they still build prototypes and take them to Death Valley and try them out in the hot, and they, yes, they still take them up into the Arctic Circle and drive them around. But the chances nowadays is they've done that 101 times, actually in a simulator, before they've actually taken the vehicle. So this massively speeds up the time it takes to develop a product. And that same software, of course, also runs the tools of production. So there's a big software um, revolution underlying this. And then we have novel materials, um, carbon fiber, nanoparticles, um, all sorts of things coming there. Um, carbon fiber has transformed aerospace already. It's, it's going to be some big changes in car making as well with it. Uh, cheaper and better robots. We have a second generation of robots coming now, and they're, they're kind of the PC version of, uh, of the uh, industrial robot, which was like the mainframe computer. Big, expensive, slow, and uh, took a whole IT department to run. These new robots are cheaper and smaller. Rodney Brooks from MIT, uh, his company, Rethink Robotics, has got a $22,000 robot now that works with people. And then you have these online manufacturing services, which, um, as was said, we can now get almost anything you want made. To be a manufacturer, in fact, all you need now is a laptop, some design software, an internet connection, and you're away. Just about everything you can get, want, you can get out there um, somewhere. And then we have new production processes. There are a number. Nike has one called Flyknit, where they're using a high-speed knitting machine now to make trainers. And uh, that really takes the labor out of the, the whole, whole matter of making trainers. So why then do you need a factory in Vietnam where these things are sewn up when you can produce a set of trainers custom made to your feet, um, possibly in the store? Nike aren't doing that yet, but that's the logical extension of the technology that they now have um, to work on that. So it's not just 3D printing. There are other 3D production processes as well. But I'll stick with 3D printing for the moment. Um, rapid prototyping was the first and original use of this technology, and it's the one where I came across it. As I said, it's, as you in the computer, you can rapidly um, test and uh, digitize your products. You can actually, using a 3D printer, you can produce physical versions of them as well, from uh, Formula One parts to test in a wind tunnel, complete dashboards for a car. Um, these, these would take days and days to get out of a traditional machine shop um, for the product planning. Now you can look at that dashboard, dashboard for that car and say, that's pretty hideous. 
Um, I, what I want to do is something like this, and they'll print you another one overnight. So the, the speed up uh, process is enormous for rapid prototyping. You can do more iterations. You can be more sure that a product is right before you commit to production. Early adopter, definitely healthcare. We're all different, and they already have your CAD file in the form of a, uh, a medical scan. Number of uh, uses here. Uh, most hearing aids, well, many, he I'm not sure the numbers are, but it's, it's in the millions already of hearing aid shells are being produced with 3D printers already. Now, they're either printing the plastic shell itself or they're printing the molds from which the shell are made. And because every ear canal is different, these are being custom made. The numbers are in the millions already and then the electronics are added afterwards. The Invisible Braces is a company called Align Technologies. Their brand name is Invisalign and they 3D scan your mouth. Uh, they can then show you on a computer modeling system how they could change your smile and then they use 3D printers to produce the molds that, that are made uh, which they will use to make these transparent braces which you wear over a period of a year or so and they gradually pull your teeth into shape. So this is a system that doesn't completely do away with metal braces because it's limited in its ability but it does away with a lot of them. Um, it's, it's a business that didn't exist without 3D printing. It is, in fact, mass customization. And last year, they printed 17 million of these things. Um, human body parts, um, both for um, replacement surgery and uh, cells, uh, printing of uh, 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 tissue is just beginning. The first products we're likely to see are cellular models for the drug industry so they can test directly um, on a cellular model made with a 3D printer. But eventually you'll start to see small skin grafts and pieces of blood vessel being uh, produced with a 3D printer using stem cells and quite possibly somewhere down the line organs such as the liver, which uh, the people doing this believe will be one of the first uh, uh, actual organs for transplant that they will be able to make with a 3D printer. I mentioned the consumer area and the craft and the art area. Um, yes, they've really gone for this in a big way, partly because you can make things that you just couldn't make with traditional manufacturing. Uh, this is a lampshade, and um, when you see this thing, it's, it's really quite remarkable. And I would defy anyone to tell me how they could make that with a conventional manufacturing system. You just couldn't do it. There's hardly any parts that touch in there. The only way I think that that could be made is if you could find an old-time Chinese ivory carver and gave him about 30 years. He might be able to do it. Uh, the guy at the top I spoke to yesterday, he just had a, uh, an art exhibition where he's an artist and um, he kind of pimped his ride, which is a 1971 Ford Torino there. Um, he, he has some very clever uh, processing with 3D printing um, in which um, he produces this liquid metal effect. Um, he, he comes from Romania. He's living in the United States now. Ford were very interested in this, but they wouldn't tell him how, he wouldn't tell them how he did it. And the, the fashion shows, and uh, these are bespoke kitchen cabinet knobs which are available in Europe from a Belgian company. So when you design your kitchen, you can, have, you can design the own, your own knobs for these. And th these cost about 15 euros online, and they're custom-made to your own design. So custom-made knobs for kitchen cabinets... I mean, that just wasn't possible with conventional manufacturing. And then we come to the top end, the aerospace and the automotive. Um, the top picture, these are widgets, but they illustrate very vividly the difference between additive manufacturing, the posh name for 3D printing, um, and conventional manufacturing. The bracket on the right, these are by Eads, the people who make Airbus, um, is made the traditional way. You take a big block of titanium and you cut away 85% 80, of the material, which is wasted, and you end up with a bracket like that. It's expensive, slow, very wasteful. The one on the uh, left was made with a 3D printer uh, where it uses a laser to sinter the powder. Uh, there's no wastage of material. It's as strong, it's lighter, um, and it can be customized very easily with a tweak of software. Um, Aeroplanes, some... No, increasingly a number of aircraft are now being made with 3D printed parts. Not yet in the, um, the main stress areas, although that will come, quite believe it. 
The Irby is a small 3D printed car, uh, well, 60, 70% of it's 3D printed. And the jet engine belongs to General Electric, who's taken one of the biggest punts with this technology. Now, their next generation of jet engine, they will be using 3D printers to make the fuel injectors, and they'll be making them by the thousand. And the reason they're doing that is the material, the material science involved has got to the point now where they just can't use that materials in a traditional manufacturing process. It's too brittle. You can't, you can't drill it. You can't cut it. You can't machine it. So they're having to build it additively. And also the shapes that they want to make, again, can't be made with traditional processes. So to get the leap in performance and efficiency for the next generation of jet engines, GE is investing heavily in additive manufacturing. Very in-house custom production system they'll be using. And you'll see quite a number of these in-house systems. And this is an interesting area which is fairly new but um, will be very uh, important in the future and that's the printing of functional electronics. What's going on down at the bottom here, unfortunately this wasn't Foxconn but it's a company that's very much like it and it's in China and that is printing the circuits for an aerial directly into the cell, into the back of a cell phone case. Now, our cell phones have got more and more features over the years. There's, there's Wi-Fi, there's Bluetooth, there's uh, near-field communication, there's, there's wireless, there's, um, and there's the cell to make the call, and all of these require aerials, and they're taking up more and more space inside the cell phone. So this process actually prints those aerials directly into the case of the cell phone, and there's four of these printers sitting on the production line in China running at the rate of several thousand a time. And this is prototype, it's only trialing technology. But it's, way, it's the way the thought process is going. If you can print the object, why not print the electronics as well? Xerox, I was at uh, Park uh, uh, a few days ago, and um, they have a, a big interest in printing electronics. And they also have a, a process which is nicely known as chips in ink, because the ink in the 3D printer actually con contains the electronics the capacitors, the resistors, and the transistors. And so they can print that down, and then they're using various techniques to try and get the transistors to uh, line up. So you're printing functional um, uh, uh, processes in it as well. The Game Boy controller was printed at a university in England, and Disney are playing around with printing toys that, uh, with their electronics contained in them. Tools, jigs, molds, another great area. Um, uh, I go quickly now. The toilet seat belongs to uh, an American airline who are having leaky toilets on their airplanes. Uh, problem they've got is uh, their MD 80s, McDonnell Douglas, are not around anymore. So uh, it could be rather expensive going to Boeing and saying, Can you make me 20 kits to re plumb our MD 80s so we can get them back in the air? Um, well, the company's 3D printing the plumbing for the aircraft at a fraction of the cost it would take a traditional manufacturer to do that. So you're seeing a, a lot surprising movement in that, this area. And in some cases, the 3D printing is being used to make the molds that will be used um, in um, traditional manufacturing, like injection um, molding. So this, this odd thing is going on with additive manufacturing that I don't think we've really seen in many technologies before. We're seeing it enter at the top is where you expect a new technology to come in, in aerospace and in car, make, car making and high-end engineering. But we're seeing this one come in at the bottom as well. So you have machines at the top which cost $700,000, machines at the bottom that cost less than $2,000. And they're all doing the same thing. And there's dozens of different ways of 3D printing, and I keep coming across more and more of them. But they're all having an impact on manufacturing in one way or another. And... What does this mean for those countries that have relied on having lay, um, low labor costs? Well, those labor costs in China certainly are um, going up. And I was in China recently tracking down them, 3D printing companies. And the Chinese see this technology as a way of upgrading their own industry as um, the days of cheap offshore um, low labor costs become less relevant to them. And China's astronauts ride up into space in 3D printed seats and the guys at the bottom have 12 meter long 3D printers, which um, they're using to make in titanium aircraft parts. Uh, this is for China's own aerospace program because China has the intention of producing um, an airliner to rival those made by Boeing and Airbus. 
And um, yeah, I think from this work, it's only prototype work at the moment, that when that aeroplane appears, uh, we'll find that a good part of it is being made with 3D printing. Which um, brings me back to that uh, replicator. Well, a little while ago, uh, NASA, took, NASA took a 3D printer up into space in the famous uh, Vomit Comet as a trial, and it went very well. And uh, next year, they're taking one up to the space station to, uh, to make parts, spare parts, and to make tools. So the vision we began with of that Star Trek replicator, you know this odd feeling that science fiction sometimes does become science fact? And that's it. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, everyone, I think you'll agree that's a fantastic talk and with a very quick change in game. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Peter Marsh uh, to the stage who for a long time wrote for the Financial Times and did a similar set of studies as Paul on the impact and the uh, business aspects of uh, 3D printing and additive manufacturing. So please welcome to the stage Mr. Peter Marsh. Thank you. Right. Where's your little thing? Yes. <clears throat> uh, well, uh, well it, it really is a kind of rapid uh, sequence, the, all, all this, isn't it? But I'm, I'm going to, I hope, um, fill in um, a, a, a few gaps around the edges of all this. Um, I, I, I wrote a book that came out last year, um, again, called The New Industrial Revolution, with a kind of subtitle to it. And it fitted in with Paul's um, take on all this, apart from the fact I count up five industrial revolutions while he counts up three. But um, that's, that's the point of detail, really. I've, I've just come back from China, where I spent uh, a week actually talking to people about this very point. And um, the, the, the Chinese are all terribly interested in this. They, they, unlike the feeling that some people have in America, that they're rather on the offensive, they're actually quite defensive. They're, they're a bit worried about where they go in manufacturing. They think um, these ideas about the new industrial revolution could, could, uh, could help them. Um, I'm going to try and fit 3D printing into what I see as the bigger picture. Um, and um, th that's the subject of this, really, for the next 10, 15 minutes. What I'm trying to do is to talk about where 3D printing fits into some of these broad trends, uh, what, what American companies are doing, and then what are the implications for policy uh, in, in, in a much more general way. Um, well, I, I think we've talked a bit about materials, but we ought to just say what these materials are. The, the, the interesting thing is that in the whole world of manufacturing, there are only 150 things which are the elements of, of the universe that anyone can do anything with. Of those, only 100 or so are readily available. And um, it, it just shows us what the limits are to our capabilities. You, you, mankind has got only those hundred or so things that it can do anything with. And, of course, 3D printing is working with some of them. Um, again, people talk about it as an additive technology, as though that is new. Well, this form of it, of course, is new in the sense you're kind of squirting things together um, um, in a way you hadn't done before. But, of course, additive technology has been around a long time. Welding is an additive technology. I suppose I'm a strong believer in this idea that if you really look at kind of new things, in fact, they're not so new after all. Um, I just want to fill in a bit of context here. Um, I mean, we've had all this about people, what, 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 what they say about it, so we won't dwell on that. And Paul has talked a bit about that, so I won't dwell upon the different sizes. I don't think he's had this picture. It just shows you you can get down to um, um, the absurd, we, we, we could say, from, from the big processes. Um, but I, I think why 3D printing is important, A, it's brought a lot of attention to the world of manufacturing. As Bjorn pointed out, it, it, it gets people involved in a very hands-on way in manufacturing in a way that they perhaps wouldn't have done a few years ago. But it, but it also fits into the idea of 
saying design, digital design is important, you can link it up to manufacturing, um, it, it's, it does facilitate the production of, of the co- kind of complicated parts that the world increasingly needs. And, of course, and it does fit in with this idea of the world of manufacturing moving more and more to small volume uh, production. If, if you can get low cost at the same time, then you're getting somewhere. And, of course, also this idea of decentralized production, no need to have giant factories all around the world just making things for the world. You can, you can have them in more localized areas. Um, well, in fact... Um, the Chinese, as I've said, are interested. Well, as, and Paul has said this as well. This is a company I went to see just a few days ago in Beijing, called Beijing Longhuan. Um, again, it's just always odd to to, to 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 read stuff about the Chinese taking over the world and then go there and to work out that the factory of this uh, company is really nothing at all special. Um, it's it's a rather dingy place, actually. Um, and, of course, they're looking at the Americans and saying, actually, they're, they're a lot better than us. It's, it, 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 very often you come to America and people are kind of over-worried about the Chinese. And, and you, you go to China and, and you realize that they're worried about the Americans. So probably somewhere in between is, uh, is reality. Um, the, the, it's, of course, not just making possible um, this customized production. It is... 3D printing, it is making parts that you just can't make in any other way. And this is a, a mould for, I think, a set of heat, ex- a, a, a heat exchanger. And, you, and they, again, you just wouldn't be able to make that any, any, any other way. But of course, there, there are big applications. These, these are aerospace engines, for example. Um, and this is a big but that perhaps one should talk about at this stage. Um, At this moment, uh, the the number of 3D printing machines in the world is really rather tiny. Of that 120,000 or so, um, uh, something like two-thirds of them are the low-cost machines that really, at the moment anyway, aren't going to do anything all that complicated. Only one-third are what you call your serious industrial machines. And, of course, sales of 3D printers are again tiny, Um, it's less than a billion, uh, if you count up what the sales of conventional computer-controlled machine tools are, it's it's a hundred times higher. Of of course, we we say that, but we're in at the start of something, in a few years' time, the the picture could change. Um, And of course, there's only 20% of these, um, um, of, of, of all the applications of these machines that are being used in direct parts production, the, the, the rest is for prototyping and so on. Um, I, I thought it'd be good just to try and fit this into where American manufacturing is at the moment. Um, it's, it's U.S. manufacturing, having led the world for 100 years in terms of being the biggest manufacturer, is now the second biggest manufacturing country in the world with about 17% of world manufactured output. Uh, China's about 20%. But, of course, the important thing is that there's 10 million people working in American manufacturing, 100 million people working in Chinese manufacturing, um, productivity in America for something almost the same size is, is much, much higher. Um, and the, the areas where you do see some of the good companies doing things in America are very much things that fit in a bit to 3D printing, but of course require other things other than 3D printing. It's, it's that set of um, ideas there which I'm just going to go and dwell on in the next five minutes or so. Um, oh yeah, well th- this just gives this gives the uh, full picture for those who are interested in the statistics, uh, where you can see America number two. Um, well, th- th- there's a number of areas where if you're going to be good at um, production in the 21st century, then you've got to come up with something new. Um, Dash Robotics, I think Bjorn mentioned, they're sitting here in this building making small uh, automated devices, which you you wouldn't have been able to do before, and again using 3D printing to some degree. Um, Also in California, something that people wouldn't have thought about a few years ago, these are little robots for 
um, for controlling the uh, positioning of solar arrays. And so you, you need these robots to make sure these are fitting all the time, looking at the sun. Um, this, uh, this company in California virtually invented an industry for itself here. Um, again, another small company quite um, in San Diego, I think, who's using 3D printing to some degree to make smart drones. Th this is the new product side of things. Um, coming back to variation, um, again, if you're going to be a good manufacturer today, very often you are going to be good at varying your, uh, your products. This, this is a very nice company in Chicago, Winsler, who's one of the world leaders in making plastic gears for all kinds of applications. They've got a beautiful plant. They're, they're, as far as I know, they're not using 3D printing. They're using these smart uh, machine tools, which, which we shouldn't ignore, if you like, the old technology, but uh, enhanced considerably by software and modern, modern ideas. Uh, it's, it's worthy to, to, to mention with them because it's, it's put a lot of effort into... Uh, kind of advertising what it's doing and it's, it's even building these uh, lift trucks just made from from these funny gears and oh you can pr you, you, we've talked about 3D printing being used to make fashion items but um, this is a woman wearing a dress just made of these plastic gears um, customization again um, company in Pennsylvania making about um, 10,000 different types of coatings. Again, not using 3D printing by any means, but using uh, clever chemistry, really, uh, coatings for non-stick -stick frying pans to, for, or, or, or all kinds of industrial applications where you need to protect your uh, product from the environment. Um, and, and one other area where American manufacturing is, of course, gaining, which we shouldn't ignore, is these low energy costs. This is one... Um, example of a company, an uh, Austrian company, one of many in the high energy end of things who are coming to America to do things because of the shale gas revolution. You can always write a book about that, of course. Um, and then it seems to me as though if you are going to be, uh, want to be a, a leader, you're going to have to specialise in something. This is another company nearby here making these specialised irrigation control um, products that fit into these type of irrigation systems, which are going to be required more and more in the world to make sure that what supplies of water you have, you can um, control. They could do with some of those in China where there's a huge water shortage. And, um, to, to, towards, and also, um, it, again, if you're going to be proficient in, in modern manufacturing, then if you can do things that other people can't do, like this company Paragon, based in uh, in um, Warsaw, Indiana. Uh, these these are these these are products for the orthopedics industry. You, you're going to get getting somewhere. Th this is a company that does fit into an expanding industry. Uh, orthopedics is something that more and more people require to to mend damaged knees, hips, etc. It also fits into this globalized pattern. They've got a plant in China. This is the one that. They're opening. So it's no good just doing it in one place. If you're going to be good at this, you want to try and do it in several places. And more and more of these relatively small companies are seizing the, uh, the, the opportunities from globalization and, and going abroad. This one, no exception. And it, and it offers new, new possibilities. Um, we've talked about orthopedics for humans. Um, and possibly they could get to other, other, other kinds of... Um, Industries as well. That I means orthopedics for dogs, I think, is the next big thing. Um, so, uh, what are the implications for policy? Very uh, quickly, um, I, th I think if I was in charge of um, policy making, looking at uh, new manufacturing ideas, one of the things you've got to do is just to accent what the possibilities are. Talk about the the role models of those companies who are doing interesting things. Um, you, you are, I think, going to see a, a, a partial return of manufacturing to some of the high-cost na nations who have lost out over the last 20 years as a lot of manufacturing has gone off to other places such as China. Um, small, flexible units are going to be the norm. A lot of these companies aren't going to be big ones. They're going to be small ones. You are going to bring in service thinking into your manufacturing.
disciplines, there's going to be more and more opportunities for the niche industries um, of the kind of some of them I've just mentioned. I think anyone looking for manufacturing in the future to employ directly huge numbers of people is going to be disappointed. It's not going to be an area which goes back to the vast numbers of people who were employed in manufacturing 50 years ago. But it is going to create jobs um, that, that, that are good jobs, technology-intensive jobs, well-paid jobs, directly employed in manufacturing. And out of all that will come uh, a wealth creation effect from which service industry can can follow. So um, out of all that, um, th th that's, that's, that, that's a few thoughts about where the whole world is manufacturing, wh where the whole world of manufacturing is moving uh, with, with 3D printing, I think, fitting into that. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, so you can see we're moving up the food chain, as it were, uh, to now the broadest economic picture that Professor Zeisman from our economics department and the Berkeley Roundtable on International Economics is now going to give us the broad view and summarize many of the things you've heard. Please welcome John to the podium. Well, first of all, I should be really clear that... Um, the economics department would disown me. Um, my appointment's in political science. Oh, John, I, I apologize. And no, 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 no. I don't mind, but they would. So uh, since I don't have an official union card, which means there's things you can and can't say. Or, or that. But in any case, um, I want to open this quickly to discussion. So I'm gonna, I, I have no slides. Uh, and I want to cover some issues uh, and try and situate the conversation uh, somewhat quickly. Um, where does this whole conversation fit in the broader uh, discussion about jobs, economic growth, and development, and the like. Uh, I think what we need to be clear about is that for advanced industrial countries, the real objective is to expand the income of, of citizens and sustain the growth of employment and productivity. And to do that, uh, what I want to suggest very simply is that they have to escape what we've come to call the commodity trap. Now, what is the commodity trap? It's not the trap about, you know, copper and oil and so forth. It is rather price-based competition throughout markets for goods and services uh, that have really come as technology has diffused, management skills have diffused. And that diffusion of know-how of, of technology and of man, of production uh, puts pressure on wages and prices in very dramatic kinds of ways, uh, with the consequences that uh, it's very hard to create rents. It's very hard to create value added. So what, in fact, uh, do you do? Uh, the result uh, of that diffusion of technology is an array of, comp of competitors, an array of uh, forms of competition uh, as diverse entrants come into the markets throughout the world. And the consequences of all that uh, sort of pressure, what we call the commodity trap, is on jobs. Let's take one piece of that. Uh, very clear, it has two kinds of consequences. One is that lots of jobs move offshore faced with wage and price uh, competition. Uh, and doing so as they move offshore, uh, the difficulty is that in many cases the value has stayed in the advanced countries. It's very clear that, in fact, it's not the workers in China who are getting all the value. It's the IP at Apple. It's the IP at uh, a lot of the uh, tech companies that are uh, actually where the values uh, exist. Uh, real studies have been done, some at Berkeley, some in Finland, some, else, some at Davis, actually, uh, that have taken actual products like the iPhone or the Nokia product uh, and the like and broken them down component by component to really figure out where the value actually is stayed. And these uh, are uh, very clear kinds of consequences. So jobs move offshore, but they don't necessarily raise anybody's wages. They put pressure on, on wages in the advanced countries while not necessarily really raising wages easily around the world. The other half, of course, is that the production has to be automated in um, some significant way. And that, of course, also sort of eats into uh, jobs. So the question then becomes that, that we ask over and over that both Peter and Paul have really been uh, addressing in an important way is are the Luddites right? Were those group of workers back in the 19th century Britain uh, who, who were in fact uh, correct that they in fact were going to lose their jobs? What they were wrong 
wrong about was, of course, that economic development took place, uh, the societies of which they were part uh, continued to grow, and we've had that conversation over and over and over. So the question is, is this time uh, somewhere or uh, in some important way different? And I'm going to be agnostic on that other than to say that, as Peter suggested in, at, at the end of his talk and Paula suggested, it's very easy to see where the jobs are going. They're being carved out by automation, by moving things offshore. It's always much harder to see where the new jobs are going to come from. Uh, and uh, one way of phrasing that is that there are going to be jobs in building all the tools. I mean, Bjorn, before the, uh, his conversation, was saying, you know, somebody had to teach all the students how to make all the design tools uh, that were going to be used for 3D printing. You're going to have the very fact you're going to have mass customization, small companies, I mean, there are going to be a vastly greater number of jobs uh, designing what, in fact, gets built uh, in that light. So that, in fact, there are going to be these new tools that are going to be used in new ways. So who builds and who applies these new kinds of tools? And important ways as well, one of the things I think we're slowly uh, uh, realizing, and again, I find Bjorn and I agree uh, quite thoroughly, is that machines alone and people alone, uh, that's not the competition. The, uh, the, uh, the Bjorn, what, how does he say his name? The, the, the MIT economist uh, who's written Race Against the Machine. Uh, it's not a race against the machine. The real question isn't whether people are going to be uh, displaced because uh, the routine will get automated, but how new combinations of machines and I, of digital technologies, smart technologies, become used by people. Uh, we know that uh, you know very clearly that a uh, that a combination of a chess, not even a master, and a good chess machine will be either the chess master or the chess machine. Uh, it's the combinations that are going to be interesting over time. So the question really then becomes, what are the ways out of this commodity trap? Uh, what's easily said is, it's the easy thing to say, is create distinctive high-value added products, both goods and services. Uh, and the emerging transformation of production of goods and services is dramatically altering what is produced and where. Uh, the qu tough question is how to do that, either for a firm or for a place. Exactly what kind of policies uh, does one actually in concrete ways propose? Let me add one thing to our discussion here, though, which is to say that manufacturing story does not stand on its own. Uh, it runs alongside of it and is entangled with a story about information technology enabled services, which is a critical part of the transformation going on. As people have faced the commodity trap, they start to find value uh, in uh, not just in the servicing of a product or in uh, services flipping hamburgers, but in a tr what we've come to call the algorithmic revolution. As things can be codified and be uh, formalized, uh, they can be, uh, in a real sense, automated. And so we see, um, as some of you know, many years ago, the economist, quite talented, brilliant economist, Beaumont, uh, argued that uh, everything was going to end up a service, and manufacturing was going to, in a sense, displace work, because you couldn't increase productivity in services. If the advanced countries were going to face a series of dilemmas. Uh, at the time, Beaumont wrote another guy by the name of Gordon Moore wrote a little article about uh, uh, semiconductors, and in the end, uh, the advance in digital processing trumped uh, the Beaumont law. And Beaumont, as he says, I wrote that long before there was a digital age. Uh, it's not so much a criticism of him. He says, that was the old age, this is the new. The application of the algorithmic revolution to services, we see highly automated services, search engines, uh, 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 finance. We see hybrid processes in which, uh, in fact, whether it's OnStar in cars or, you know, we'll rescue you when you crash, or whether it's nurses uh, being integrated in monitoring uh, uh, of, uh, of patients, new hybrid systems emerge, and entirely uh, personal systems that, in fact, support um, the uh, development of, uh, uh, of restaurants or so on. Uh, open table, which I'm sure most of you have used at one point or another, is an example of that. But equally important is that, in fact, it's a response to this commodity trap. Let me give you uh, one quick example uh, and then try and, 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 and close, which is there's a, there are two Finnish companies that build cranes. Uh, one is Kona, uh, an ex-Kona 
company called Kona, uh, uh, Elev uh, Kona Elevators, and the other is Cargo Tech. And they faced intense competition from the Chinese. Now, obviously, they're going to produce the products in new and different kinds of ways in its own right, but what, is the, 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 what do you do faced with mass production techniques from the Chinese that make a lot of their products just ex their elevators and their lifts and their cranes expensive? Well, Cargo Tech decided it would go into the port management business. Okay, now that sounds like a, you know, a lot of hype, but the hype that you're talking about, we're going to sort of suddenly produce things in a new kind of way. Well, they meant it. What they meant was, and they bought an Oakland company uh, that, in fact, uh, builds the software systems for port management. They would integrate their equipment so that you could manage your port, and you'd say to the Chinese, fine, go buy a Chinese crane, but your port's going to still be more expensive to run. So if you buy our integrated system, uh, you're, in fact, going to create advantage so that, in fact, it becomes an integrated kind of product. And these new service systems look a lot more like manufacturing. Uh, they involve heavy investment, design, construction, and the very enormous server farms that exist, um, in fact, create a certain kind of inventory. A lot of the old arguments about what services were, things delivered uh, when they were created, begin to look a lot different. The cost of a server farm, as many of you know, a Google server farm edges up on a billion dollars. So it doesn't exactly look like, you know, Downton Abbey or something uh, <laughs> like that. Uh, so that, therefore, my view of this matter is, is when we hold these conversations, we need to stop talking about just manufacturing or stop talking about just uh, services, and we need to talk about production yeah. and the revolution in production, both of goods and, uh, and of services, in which there are different elements in both, but the way in which they become integrated is, in fact, going to be uh, the way out of this commodity trap. One last comment on that, then, is uh, how these techniques and technologies are used will depend very heavily on policy. Uh, the question becomes not whether or not you displace jobs, but if you take the retail industry, if you look at Walmarts, you're downskilling, you're displacing skilled workers. If you look at the Danish retail industry, you're upskilling. Uh, more and more responsibilities are being put in onto the shop floor. So a lot depends on the skill levels, depends on the training, the corporate strategies, and uh, the like. So that, in fact, it becomes a very powerful question of we're entering a new world of production, manufacturing, and services. What it does to us will be what we choose. Thanks. Yeah, that was great. Uh, Paul, let me invite you to this uh, We have 10 minutes or so just for some uh, in introductory questions and uh, I think there are microphones going to go around the, the room. Let me, let me, as we're getting settled here, let me pick up on some of those comments. Uh, John, in that last point uh, you made, uh, and, and please, please interject, um, you mentioned the word policy. But the interesting thing is so much of this is built up from the ground floor where there's no policy almost around. So both Paul and Peter and John might like to comment quickly on how there seems to be a, a revolution happening um, and it's coming up from the ground floor. These maker uh, organizations and uh, many different people that want to get involved in, in products. Do you think this can happen without policy, or is it just going to happen? Can it happen completely organically? This, these new, these new directions. Well, um, th this is judged from a big report into the future manufacturing, which we have in English. Um, and they pinpointed one of the problems is policymakers don't actually understand what manufacturing is. Right, right, yeah, good point. Uh, because they look at a world of 20, 30 years ago that you were describing, where you had a big factory that had a lot of semi skilled jobs in it. Now, manufacturing is completely different. Many countries make, much more, make a lot of revenue from services that are attached to their product. And a classic example is Rolls Royce, the aerospace company that, that makes their engines. And they don't sell jet engines anymore. What they do is they go to an airline and they lease to the airline power by the hour. So what they sell the airline is a contract. Is we will lift your aircraft up, all your aircraft, and take them wherever they want to go on a contract in which you pay us where we will provide power for the hour. So suddenly Rolls-Royce is responsible for all the servicing, supply of the engines. So it's in their interest to keep the parts down cheaply. It's in their interest to make sure the aircraft is serviced regularly. Rolls-Royce now gets over half its income from services as opposed to manufactured products. So Peter, that was the fourth last bullet on your slide, right? I think this combination of 
old style manufacturing and service that's the way it, forward it, for it, a, it, well, it did, and, and uh, John came up with a great example. But, but on, uh, with, with the cargo tech company, um, but um, just on that point about policy, I, I think it is true that a lot of people, not just politicians, um, don't really understand what's going on. But I, I don't think it particularly matters, because you don't necessarily need to go into huge detail about all this um, to, 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 to learn about every last ingredient. Um, quite a long time ago, an, an esteemed professor of manufacturing in the UK said to me, actually, all you need to worry about with, with manufacturing is three things, either at the level of policy making or indeed companies. And, and, he's, and, and this remains true, and I've, I've often thought about this, and it is very true. He, he, he said, policy means just encourage people to, um, to, to develop talent, get, and, and, and hire good people. By that he meant people with an all-round view of the world. Second thing, learn to transfer technology. Not necessarily develop it, invent it yourself, but know about other people's technology, use it. And the third thing, develop a global view. And I think for any politician to, to, to bear those three things in mind and to try to inculcate that thinking in other people is, is all, all you need to worry about. John, you'd agree with that, I think. I would, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think this issue of levels of talents is an, an important one. Uh, one of uh, my acquaintance and friends in Denmark who actually took a hearing aid company of one that, that you referred to and took it when it was bankrupt and turned it into a world power, took the position that his success of his company depended entirely on the level of training and talent of the lowest trained person in the country. And the reason was that defined his workforce. That defined what he was able to do and what he was able to imagine doing. Uh, so the question is not just whether we at Berkeley can run innovative things at mm -hmm. Citrus and so forth, but in the junior colleges and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the around the, not just around the state but around the country, uh, will those levels of skills be available? Uh, will people be able to do the designs? Will they have the math okay. to be able mm -hmm. to do those sorts of things? So I, I would uh, put great emphasis on okay. that if we want it to be a broad that's, that's, story. That's very important. Let me hand a man there. Uh, yeah. I please, wanted, please jump in. I wanted to take exception to... Um, the, the, you said high-end manufacturing. I think we're at an inflection point that this is great, we should have high-end manufacturing, but to, to fill the jobs, I think we're going to see a tremendous amount of manufacturing coming back to this country because you can go over the economics. I'm just a dumb engineer. But you direct manufacturing costs, usually a good manufacturing operation, 6 to 8%. You're getting into logistics costs of 10% now, overcoming the cost of direct labor in China. So, I mean, right there is the economics, um, and, and, and then you've got the inventory control, the amount in, in, in the pipeline, which costs money, plus quality control, and I don't think the Chinese ever uh, mortalized Deming that the Japanese did. So, I have seen GE put quality control managers in factories in Japan, I mean in China, for a year to get the product done well. I know many people that think 20 to 30 percent of the product coming over they have to sort through because the quality is so bad. Just those factors alone and with Walmart putting fifty billion dollars in the commitment to buy on the US, I don't think you're talking about that really going to come back tremendously and with the cheap energy right now. Okay. So I want your point. point so let me um, Can I make one simple Yeah please comment? do and then I was gonna I think the, sim the simple comment would be yes, you're absolutely right. The question is there won't be jobs on the shop floor in the same way. So that the question becomes exactly what are the processes by which we sustain high value high wage kinds of jobs over time. I think the issue that things are going to come back is correct. Okay. Uh, since just a second since Peter just Actually, I wanted to thank Peter, especially he stepped off a flight from Shanghai this very morning. And um, <laughs> and uh, so I, uh, with that perspective, I mean, you must have a sort of gut feeling from your recent trip now about the, 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 is, is there a sudden surge forward because of cheaper energy and the inventory and kind of cost that we're talking well, about? Well, yes. I, I, I mean, I, th I think certainly if you're sitting in America, you, you, you can feel that, that, that you're onto something, really, because of these low energy costs and the way that will kind of um, permeate through the economy. And, and um, again, I think you're right to, 
to kind of home in on this point, what do you mean by high-end manufacturing? Because I think that there, there are plenty of, of possibilities for people to do things, making really rather clever products, but doing jobs that are not that removed from what you were seeing 50 years ago. I mean, for example, in the UK, um, there are some good companies um, y employing um, people doing fairly, if you like, old-fashioned textiles um, sewing jobs, uh, but, but making very nice products, again, customised. The, the, the difference is that you're not seeing huge volumes of these, um, of, of these people doing those jobs, but the actual jobs are still there, um, but not, not, in so, not in so much quantity. I mean, coming back to China... Um, as, as I said, they, they have this defensive feeling. They, they feel that they don't know the answers to how to upgrade their production to make it more sophisticated, um, to be able to compete better in, in the, in, in the, um, it, as, as the century goes on. Um, they feel they're short of answers, they're short of technology, they're short of design skills, they're, they're short of talent. You read all this stuff about how many engineers that are coming out of the universities, many people realise that these, the engineers aren't equipped with this lateral thinking that you do need if you're going to be good in manufacturing in the future. Uh, and Paul, maybe you can pick up on this too, because as we were talking beforehand, you were saying we were, so, as the uh, volume production of 3D printed products begins to go up, there, there's a, this, we're in this sort of balanced area now in 2013 where there are some products that might suddenly start being made in volume by certain 3D printing techniques that, and beyond jewelry, I mean, too. Yeah, yeah. So, so we might be reaching another tipping point. Where, yeah, where I mean, that there, there will be another wave of innovation, particularly in metal printing next year when some of the patents come off. I mean, why the plastic printing is so cheap is patents have come off. That begins to happen with some of the laser printing next year. Um, the, the inflection point there is where... Um, this is a sense I've got from visiting some 3D printing factories, is they start doing parts for prototyping or to help mass production companies out because something's broken on the line, or they haven't got enough of this, they haven't got enough of that, so they can use the 3D printing to fill in the gaps. And they're starting to look at the quality of the 3D printing, and we've got to bear in mind this technology is, what, 25 years old, so it's still quite young. And they're saying, actually, these parts aren't bad. You know, we're, <laughs> we're close to the point now where we can send off for a metal tool that's going to cost $10,000 and it's going to take two months to make. But we can use a 3D printed one that costs um, you know, two, dollars $300 and we can get it overnight. Well, we can actually use these and throw these away every week and then yeah. not bother with the metal one. And we get increased flexibility. But another point about bringing manufacturing back and um, to develop markets, um, besides economics and labor costs, is that I think we're moving into a world where you see product innovation and process innovation becoming one of the same thing. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, to go to go back to, to GE again, I mean, if you're going to have an innovative new jet engine that will use 5, 6, 7% less fuel, it's going to be directly related to the fact that you've got an innovative manufacturing right. process right. that can produce it. And those and you need the two people working, working together, together yeah. close to close, close together. And that means you need your brightest brains, yep. not just yep. in a research lab, but in your factory. But in the production well. lab too. Yeah. That, actually, that's, he made a very important point there. Uh, I'm feeling guilty that we're going over time. Uh, let's, uh, let me get one more question from the floor as a, a high-level philosophical question, if I may. No, no pressure. <laughs> um, uh, should, Shelley, should you give him the microphone? Yeah, yeah okay, please go ahead. Yeah. So um, I'm a first-year graduate student in bioengineering, in bioengineering department. Um, and I'm interested in how regulatory bodies will have to grow or adapt, uh, particularly to include the medical device industry, because you showed multiple examples of implantable devices, for example, and the Medtronics and J&Js of the world already have a hard time demonstrating saf safety and efficacy for these devices when they're making thousands at a time. Now imagine a doctor making one and implanting it right <laughs> then and there. That is a very good question. I think I'm going to hand it to Paul first, because you've seen um, many of these medical companies in play, right? You've been on their Yeah, board. I mean, um, at the moment, we're, we're just entering that world. I mean, for instance, some of it won't need regulatory approval, I would suspect. 
for instance, we still have this, you know, you, you, you fracture your arm or something, and you go in, and they, they put plaster all over, and it's heavy, and it's uncomfortable. You could 3D print a perfectly fitting plastic brace with, with aerated holes and everything else to do the same job, customised to the individual patient. I don't think that requires re regulatory approval, does it? That's something you could do straight away. What, what though, they would then say, well, hips, you know, we're all different sizes at the moment, but hip replacement, but hips come in, in, you know, it's like shoes, you know, you're either an eight or an eight and a half. And if you're eight and a quarter tough, you're either going to have a hip joint that's a bit too loose or a bit too tight. And that's why you have to go back in for another operation. But if you can 3D print the perfect one for you, um, okay, there's going to have to be some regulation. But I think regulation will cope with these things. Because the, the promise of uh, what you could do with the technology is, is so great that I think regulation has to catch up. I think that's a good reply. Peter, do you want to make a final wrap-up, and John, a final wrap-up of where we might uh, um, leave, the, leave our friends and audience today? It, 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 right, okay. Well, I, I, I suppose um, it, 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 I think the, the overriding point is that... Uh, <laughs> That, that, that the number of possibilities are just enormous and, and I, it seems to me as though um, a school such as yours has got a great opportunity just to um, try to enthuse people about the range of things that, that, that are coming up. Um, it, the, the, the more bright young people enter this industry then the better it will be in 20, 30, 40 years' time. So that's my final point, I think. That's nice. John, you're, good place you're, the, man, you're the man of wisdom. No, good place to end. Okay. Well, well in that case, I want to thank you all for coming. Yeah. And please thank our, our, our distinguished panel, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. <laughs>